Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 137. And we're at Studio C and MotorWeek Central. And around our table today is writer-producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Our video editor, Joe Ligo. Glad to be here. Assistant producer, Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. And our writer, Patrick Lucas. Also glad to be here. And we're glad to have all of you listening and viewing us, for that matter. We have our lightning round, a viewer questions, uh, maybe even some rant and raves. Uh, first, though, let's go down the list of, uh, well, I'll say three road tests that we have on the show uh, at the current time. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start off with the Lamborghini Huracan Spider, which we took to uh, Roebling Road Raceway down in Savannah in February when we go down every year to do, or January, actually, to do our winter testing. Okay, guys. Um, an extremely interesting car. This, of course, the um, topless version of it. Who wants to start? Don't everybody jump in yeah, first. Robson usually starts. Yeah. Well, he does. He's got a little bit mute nah, there. Nah, usually, yeah. This is radio. Nah, no dead air. Right? I usually wait to hear the... And then he starts. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, convertible version of the Oricon, like you okay. said. Okay, tell us something Entry we don't level, know. Entry-level uh, Lambo, based on the same chassis as the R8, um, V10. Any big difference, you think, in how it drives, and for that matter, we'll get into how it looks, versus the coupe? Uh, I didn't notice anything. I've, spent, I've had both on track, you know, a couple different tracks, and... I didn't know it. You, you can't tell it. It's technically, I think, 150 pounds heavier or maybe even more than that, but uh, you don't really feel any difference. You know, the uh, the thing keeps coming up about, oh, well, it's the uh, entry-level Lamborghini, but, you know, at this price level, what how much is it cost? 267 You know, it's like, isn't that a ridiculous thing to say anymore? Well, to, um, to complain well, about, to complain that. about it being you know, like an entry level Lamborghini. Well, I don't know if anyone's complaining about it. I mean, it's just uh, how it ranks. It's cheaper than an Aventador. So, is the engine the same as the R8? Yes, V10. Yeah. Yes. And it you sounds know, great. Well, yeah, you know that's kind of interesting because it wasn't that many years ago that we we were basically saying that you know when someone tried a ten cylinder, it didn't sound very good. I think they've conquered that. How about someone else that drove it? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those cars that's just very easy to drive on the track, which is probably a good thing because, as I'd mentioned, I think, in my uh, first look, it's how much that car costs. You don't want to really be in a lot of situations where you have to be fearful of the car going off the track or anything. But four-wheel drive, uh, just gobs of power, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's very entertaining. Is it, in your opinion, or if you have the opinion of this, the easiest to drive Lamborghini on a track we've ever had? I mean, I, that's my impression, but I didn't drive it at the speed, say you did, Brian. For sure. That was the big thing when, uh, when the Oricon came out. Uh, yeah, that was absolutely the case. I mean, a lot of people are actually thinking that it's the, the, the most, easily the most gentrified Lamborghini yet. And I think it's uh, also... Very good on the street, too. I had a lot of time with it on the street. Um, has a great top ride. Down. Yeah, oh yeah, great ride. Uh, top down, which, I mean, that's when you really appreciate that. Sun, you know, blare in on your face mm. and letting everybody look at you driving around in a Lamborghini. But, uh, yeah, it's comfortable on the road. What, what about the transit? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying the most significant thing, it's like uh, it's a real convertible top. I mean, even though it's called a Spider, uh, Sometimes you'll get those kind of takeoff tops or right. whatever, uh, but it's a true... Uh, it really folds and, and yeah, everything. The hatch opens up in the back, tucks in. Which is which is really nice to have. You're not out there basically worried about it raining and trying to put together a Rube Goldberg mm-hmm. kind of uh, panel. Yeah, I, I really would think um, that it, looking at all the pictures when I edit it together, it really, the top looks well integrated. It's not one of those kind of like, oh, we just hacked it off and put cloth over it. There's... It looks visually well put together for being a convertible. I didn't like the color of it, though. I thought oh, it was I the like top that. or the whole car? No, the, the color of the top didn't really match. It was that sort of burgundy? Ooh, yeah. I think it looked good with really? that color. Yeah, I like the contrast. So it was like a gunmetal, dark gray exterior mm. with like that sort of burgundy top. I don't know. I well, that's it. an interesting point of view, Patrick. Well, Just what about that's why anybody else agrees with it? <laughs> Let, let's go to the next step and talk about, you know, most of the, a lot of these cars don't trans 
transfer from a coupe to a convertible very well. We said some pretty decent things about it. I in think our it test. I think all things considered, the color. I mean, yeah, color aside, I think it looks it's a very good looking convertible. I actually didn't drive the coupe we had last year on the track with the helmet on. Was did you notice any major? Because ch- honestly, I could not get comfortable in that car, and it's well documented. I'm taller than an average person. <laughs> really, I could not. I actually could not get into an actual driving position where I felt comfortable. The soft top did rob a little headroom, not much, but a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, have to, I, I have to agree with Greg. I basically, what limited time I spent in on the track, I was like this, yeah. and my head canted. Did you have your hand over the steering wheel like this? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> close. Yeah. Pretty close. No, not Even quite. Better. I did have both hands on the steering wheel. Uh-huh. Okay, Lamborghini Huracan Spider. Now we're going to move on to something uh, um, sort of different, our performance car challenge that we did with uh, Cars.com. And we actually divided this up into two different uh, areas, uh, basically the V8s and the non-V8s. And I'm going to let Brian uh, Robinson set the uh, stage for um, the first part, and then we'll come back to him for the second. But what were the three cars involved? Yeah, for the it was V8? more of a muscle car challenge, uh, not performance car mm-hmm. challenge. So that's uh, when you talk a muscle car, you, Camaro, Mustang, and Challenger. Uh, it's the only three out there. Specific that models? Uh, V8s, as you mentioned. So Camaro SS, um, 392 Hemi uh, Scat Pack Challenger, and uh, Mustang GT. Just the straight GT. Yes. Okay. So, uh, since you were the the man on site for that, what was your capsulize the impression of the three of them? Yeah, I mean, with the Camaro being the newest one, you could kind of see that coming as far as being the best overall. Um, but even the Challenger and Mustang were only you know one year old designs. But uh, really, you know, the Camaro was above and beyond when it comes to performance compared to the other two. It's but got, it, it wasn't necessarily the most fun. Um, you could make the argument that the Mustang, uh, more so when we get into the smaller engine cars, but, uh, the Mustang certainly has a lighter, nimble, more nimble feel to it than the, uh, Camaro, but, uh, you know, Camaro on the track was above and beyond, you know, what the Mustang was doing. The actual track performance aside, let me ask, uh, uh Patrick and Greg, if you were going to go plop your money down for one well, of those three body styles... And you've driven them. Uh-huh. What's your choice? Mustang. Why? I love the look Why? of the new one. You like the, the look new of generation it. of it? Yeah, I think it's very kind of sleek looking, but still Mustang enough. Um, looks very modern day. It was the, whereas the Challenger is retro in a cool way, and then the Camaro is just sort of. I'm kind of sick of that the same, body style. The same car you've seen since 2006. Exactly. So I would go Mustang. Greg, I think. Um <clears throat> I'd have to find a compromise here. I think the Camaro is the best car as far as driving. I don't think I like the way it looks. Um, it is actually better on the inside. I love the way the Challenger looks. Probably the worst driving car <laughs> out of the three. That's a lot to Very handle. comfortable on the inside, though. It's a big car. I think if you want to compromise, though, you'd have to go. And I would probably agree with Patrick here. The Mustang it has a little bit of both. It's not as good as a driving car as a Camaro. Mm-hmm. Not as good looking, in my opinion, as a... Uh, Challenger, but it's that one right in the middle. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, it's kind of funny how the Challenger is the ultimate muscle car, but yet everything mm-hmm. that about it that makes it the ultimate <laughs> muscle car pretty much made it not do as well in this challenge because yeah. the Camaro and Mustang have moved on. They're more, you know, going after a global sport coupes. market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But th- having said that, the Challenger did way better than I thought it would do. For sure. Yeah. I was yeah. a little surprised that, uh, and the, I kind of baited you with that question. I was looking for somebody to bring up um, something that I think we don't always talk about with performance cars, and that's just livability and visibility. Um, in the past, we've pretty much always downgraded Camaro because of the short side glass, and the new car's a little better, Not but much. you're still sitting Tiny awfully low. Tiny side mirrors, and very yeah, it's, it's yeah. Still which I think is a real problem. For that. Yeah. You mentioned price. That was something interesting. I, since I edited the test, I looked at the numbers. I'm amazed that all the prices were within like two, three grand of each other, especially mm-hmm. when I saw that they had the 392 with the scat pack and all that stuff. I thought surely all those options were going to make it 
you know, five, six grand more than the others. But they they're sit all in a, but, they sit in a little dark room and they hash <laughs> over prices. Pricing of cars is one of the biggest secrets in the business. Yeah, they want to keep are, it competitive. You have to keep it competitive for yeah. sure. Yeah, just it seemed to me it was odd that the other that the Dodge and the Chevy had like a leader on the Mustang in terms of displacement, but yet their prices were all so consistent. Uh-huh. And I, I like that because in the test, it's frustrating when you see a test where you're like, well, obviously that car won. It cost ten grand more. You know, you'll see some tests that are a little lopsided like that. Well, I'd say that was kind of a, uh, the way these comparison tests are set up. There's usually a price ceiling, although there wasn't on this one. But correct, still. but they had to be you know man, uh, V8 manuals. Yeah, but the and that uh, puts it in so a yeah, it's a cap. In case you didn't grasp the Camaro one, Challenger second, Mustang third. Let's move on to the non V8s. There, it's a little. There were the, there was a price cap, but the rules of what you could bring to the uh, event were a little more wide open. Yeah, since you can get a turbo four or six in the Mustang and Camaro, we kind of left it up to them, whichever one they wanted to uh, provide. Challenger obviously only comes with a V6, so uh, it was Challenger V6, Camaro V6, and EcoBoost Mustang. Nice choice there yeah. because we just had that one, yeah, and, yeah. and I and thought I had a ton of fun in that. And yeah. it was, and it was the overall winner. Uh, again, the Camaro is still a little bit better on track, certainly in straight line. And that Camaro V6 is pretty impressive, especially mm-hmm. with the performance exhaust. I mean, it sounds like a V8. I mean, I noticed that, like yeah. when I was editing the the drag strip shots, the Camaro sounded way better, like just through the speakers and stuff. I was like, yeah. wow, this is. Definitely the cooler sounding car, the three. And Challenger didn't quite uh, fare as well without the big a- big V8 engine to go around, so it came in third this time. But uh, I think just the overall package of muscle cars becoming more performance cars and overall livability and uh, just modernization, that's kind of why the uh, Mustang was a little bit over the Camaro. You know, we used to disparagingly call these cars, and this goes back quite a ways, secretaries cars. Uh, That really, well, not only was it in poor taste even when we used to call them that, (laughs) but these cars basically have a lot to offer in the performance area, despite the fact they've got smaller engines. Correct or not? I mean, if um, you're just buying it for a street car that you want a little bit of cred with? They're, you know, they're more legitimate than they used to be, you know, when we're talking V6s. Um, You know, you could certainly cross shop them with like a 370Z. Um, Stuff that you couldn't have done maybe 10 years ago, but still, uh, you know, I would certainly buy a V8. If I would probably buy some entirely different type of vehicle if, if I didn't want a V8, but that's just me. Uh, well, not a V8, but I just thought that the, uh, the EcoBoost Mustang that we had was did a good job making you feel like you're in a Mustang, even though the performance or the feel necessarily – or the you know the engine sound stuff like that wasn't necessarily there. You still feel like you're in a a cool muscle car. What I mean I I don't know what the sales are. What do do you think most people feel that way? Or like if you're going to get a Mustang Camaro, like you might as well get the V8 or, or why get it? Because I had mentioned one of that and I think a, like a sound bite, and I had a lot of people comment about like oh well why would you ever take a V6 when you could get a V8? No, right. a lot of it's insurance. I mean, yeah, insurance and cost. Yeah, yeah. V- yep. the entry level engines far outsell the V8s. Yeah. You know. Always have. Actually. It's not even close. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but a lot of people they they want the look and they want the interior and they want basically the uh, the heritage, mm-hmm. but they also want maybe a little better fuel economy. But insurance is a big deal, especially if yeah. you're kind of young. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on now to the other area that we spent a lot of time covering lately, and that's the Chicago Auto Show, where we. Uh, uh, deliver our uh, driver's choice awards every year and if you'd like a complete rundown of the cars that we do give did give to our driver's choice awards this year go to our motorweek.org website let's talk about briefly uh what we, the car we gave our top driver's choice award to which was the uh, volvo uh, xc90 and kind of came kind of came out of nowhere cars kind of getting out on the street now you why did we give it such a big award what's your impression well, I think it's well documented by this point. Uh, <laughs> it's an uh, incredible step for them and uh, a lot of uh, luxury for the money. Amazingly high tech laden, all the way, every safety feature you could think of, plus the uh, you know a Tesla challenging uh, big tablet type touchscreen on the inside. But just a really nice car and yeah. pretty good value. 
pretty, pretty, pretty I was going to say, value. it was really hard to pick anything wrong about that car. It just seemed like every aspect was very well done. And I think it's moved beyond just the auto journalism circuit, and now consumers are really picking up on oh, it, too. I, ta- I talked to a guy. They're flying he, off the lots. He'd only just pet. There's, like, a Volvo dealership near the high-end suburb where he lives, and he said, like, oh, man. He's like, the day I saw that there, I was like, man, that's really cool. So, but th- there was there – was, uh, I agree with you, Joe. Sorry. There was a lot at the Chicago show, actually more than usual. Uh, it's, a, it's a good show for consumers. It has more consumers that go uh, car buyers, actually, than any other show. People that actually lay down their money. Um, I guess if you the, the most significant all-new vehicle that was introduced, which is not really totally all-new, <laughs> is uh, the Nissan Armada, uh, a, a big SUV uh, based on the uh, Nissan Patrol, which is sold around the world, and the slightly down-market version of the uh, Infiniti QX80. Um, You know the QX80 pretty well. You know, they basically no longer is the Armada uh, based on the uh, pickup truck uh, frame. It's now, from the U.S., it's now basically the global platform. I wonder why they did it, and (laughs) was it a good move? Nothing exciting, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was the big headline, and I... I couldn't help but feel sort of disappointed when I saw it. It's a big SUV in a market that's selling big SUVs, but gee whiz. It's yeah, I mean, I, like, I get the move, but I just don't – it It was pretty boring. I think the – yeah, they did the move just because that Titan – it got kind of a bad rap being based on that frame and the overall quality and uh, ride and handling of it. So that was in the works to move it over to patrol, you know, before this new Titan – uh, frame arrived, so that's kind of the whole reason for for that. From so, what I can get, so is it still truck based, or is it kind of that like gray it's, area? It's it's a uh, it it certainly is a truck. Okay, yeah. without question, similar to Tour de Land Cruiser. Along yeah. that, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's like not an exact pickup equivalent to correct, it, but it's yeah. body well, at least not here. Yeah. Uh, one performance bright light from Chicago was the Camaro One LE. Yeah. Uh, kind of stripped down uh, uh, Camaro, which I'm kind of now with V6 power. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the, the other thing. It's like okay, but you know, considering how many V6s that we're seeing in the performance arena globally, yeah. probably consider makes how, how good we the just, V6s. Yeah, we just talked about yeah, how yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you're tracking, you want less weight, you know. So hey, go for it. Uh, Santa Fe and Santa Fe Sport uh, did a minor facelift. Uh, there were some utility vehicles. I guess the vehicle that was the most interesting is the uh, Kia Nero. Uh, we had seen it as a concept, and now it's in production, their first um, dedicated hybrid platform. And I assume there will be a Hyundai model coming eventually. You know, it's, it doesn't seem like the best time in the world to, to launch a hybrid, but uh, – yeah. Hybrid SUVs are f- relatively few and far between. It and looked the very s- and- yeah. It looked very small. Is that like a Sportage or something, or is it smaller than it, it looked? It looked I think it's smaller, right? Yeah, yeah it's like Soul. Really, it's, like, yeah. it's more like you know a little bit bigger than a Soul, but not nearly as big as a Sportage. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. um, you again think probably more hatchback. Uh, you know, it happens yeah. to be cubic, and, and that part of the move is right because everybody's trying to fill any gap that there is now yep. in, in the segment, and then. Now that they have a hybrid, that's just you know another step in their progression as a company. And they had well said. They well also said. Had I actually Optima. wrote that down. Wow. Yeah, I was waiting so long to finally say it. Nice. <laughs> I'm looking forward to driving it to see how much they've refined uh, the drivetrain. Of course, they've got the new uh, Kia Optima uh, hybrid and plug-in hybrid mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And so they they don't seem to be um, diminishing their. Um, outlook for hybrids even though uh the cost of of gas is is where it is today and i just came back from a uh, a green vehicle conference and i think everybody's just kind of reeling from uh that's in the green vehicle business about what's going on with gas now and lots of predictions that uh, by the end of this year it'll be different but uh we'll see Anyway, yeah. that was pretty much sums up the news from Chicago. Let's move on now to our lightning round, and this is where we give ourselves two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic. When time's up, Patrick, hit the bell. So here mm. we go. Are performance brands getting too watered down? Things like the C450 AMG or a BMW M235i, not to be confused with a pure M, uh, almost performance cars, are they more opposers than anything else? Do they take away the prestige from the pure tune- in-house tuner cars? 
Sure is getting confusing. I'll I'll say that right off the bat. What do you think? So Look at him go. Raising your hand. Yeah, he's starting the clock. Too bad. Starting the clock. Have to talk. No, he's got to raise clock. your hand. It's uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I love that M two thirty five I. The C four fifty. We had that at Roebling, right? The C four fifty AMG. That was pretty cool too. So no, I don't think it takes away the prestige because you still know that the ultimate high, like the M two or the C sixty three or whatever, you still know that those are way better. So I don't See, think it waters it down at all. I think. From a prestigious car buyer, it does. I don't like. like if you're none of us have it, that. If you're going to buy the M. Right. You're sort of exactly. That so so you that have you have a C63. Or Mer- that's now a Mercedes AMG right. C63. You don't want to see somebody pull up next to you in a With C450, the same right? And say and act like they're okay. as good as you are. I'm not saying that's how I feel, but I can see a lot of luxury car buyers. Being miffed about that. Well, now they just have more people to look down upon, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't really afford them. Yeah, the but, thing. And, but to most people who don't know a lot about cars or who study it as much as we do, they're just going to see it and say, "Oh, look, you guys have the same car," and that's just really going to yeah, make some people. Mad. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, agree with Greg. I think that there's just something like you, you. There is paying for that badge, and when you put down that much money, you don't want other people to feel like they're a mm-hmm. me too kind of car. And the thing is, Patrick is right. They're great cars. The like the C450, it's like maybe they should just be named differently. I can see them using some of the rub-off halo effect on a model that they don't plan to do the top dog in. For instance, like that would make sense, Cadillac's yeah. going to do a V-series of the new CT6, the big sedan, but they're probably not going to do a pure V. Right. Uh, okay. So they're kind of giving that it. Makes they'll, sense. they'll put some wheels on it. Well, I'm not sure it makes sense, but I can <laughs> understand it. They're trying to put some of that flavor down there on a car that will never probably get the full treatment. That, yeah, that I, I agree with Joe. That I guess I can see, but I think it waters it down. Well, I, I tend to agree with More that. specifically to Mercedes, though, the C450 AMG doesn't have the – hand-built engine like an right, amg right. right so that's another thing like now you're kind of confusing people who already knew that an amg was one man one engine mm-hmm. one person one engine. well how many right? people and now they see a, a c450 amg and they maybe assume that it is but it really isn't and how many people now even know that mercedes amg is like an entirely separate right. brand well that's another <laughs> that's, that's another that, whole story yeah. we could yeah, spend yeah, two exactly. minutes on so this tap, fractionalization this of brands Okay, thanks, everybody. Let's move on now to talk. And this is kind of a general viewer question. It didn't, it, we get it a lot uh, rather than it come from one person. Okay, with cars like uh, the LaFerrari, the McLaren P1, the new Acura NSX, Porsche 918s, we're seeing a trend in supercars with not just using electric motors for propulsion, but using electric motors in all sorts of ways in conjunction with traditional uh, high-performance gasoline engines. Is this the wave of the future for supercars, which it appears to be? Is this a blip? And are we going to see, you know, if we wake up 10 years from now, is this going to be extremely common in every car you drive? The electrification of powertrains. Is it here to stay? Or if gas stays cheap, is it going to go away? What do you think? I think it works well as, a, as like an all-wheel drive. I'm just going to say that. Augmentation, like what? What? what we the Rav Four, all well, the Toyota stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of Toyota. Yeah. The, uh, the Highlanders had it for quite a while. With intelligence. So, like the real, the rear wheels aren't actually connected to the gas motor at all, right? It's just Correct. a there little electric no kind of booster link. in the back. But, but the Europeans are using the, uh, and and for that matter, so is Acura, are using electric motors to augment the power mm. like a hybrid of the gas engine. In the case of the NSX, and I'm assuming they're not alone. They got a twin turbo V6 with a lot of turbo lag, and the, and the electric motor hooked up behind it actually fills in that gap, mm-hmm. so you don't notice it. But I guess the question is: this is very complicated stuff. Any any engineer will tell you when you got two engines, it's more complicated than one. But it sort of looks like this is a trend. Mm. I think so. Ryan, you haven't said anything. Um, I'm sure I said something along the lines <laughs> there, but uh, it, yeah, I don't know. I think we'll see more of it. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a trend or not, but I mean, why not? Is it just a cafe bit, thing because the fuel economy um, standards are there? No, I think it's just uh, you know just where we're going. I think we'll see a lot more of that before we'll see more full electrics. It's uh, you know the technology's there, the software's there. It's relatively easy, I think, to probably uh, saves to, weight. 
Yeah. Volvo's I mean, moving not? in that direction, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, like we the, talked about that before. The XC90 T8, that's going to mm-hmm. have a, uh, yeah. And they're moving, like, all their platforms to incorporate electric components. Well, just yeah. remember, we've you know, unless there's a major change coming out of Washington, you still got that mythical 54-mile-per-gallon target that they got to hit. And, um, you know, electrification looks like one major way they're going to do that. Yeah. I read something that predicts a split in the market so that you have compliance cars and hybrids and stuff that boost the corporate average. And then the cars they actually sell and make money are, you know, crossovers and stuff. But as the long problem as- is you've got to sell – it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. You've got to sell a lot of the high MPG vehicles to get the credits. Yeah. You can't just make them. You've got to sell them. Yeah, But here we are, the Europeans. You know, a lot of people felt that way until the Europeans started sticking uh, electric motors on Ferraris and McLarens and, and Porsches. And that caused every – when the 918 was first shown, that caused everybody to s- sit up and say, wow, you know, if they think they're going to do it, uh, maybe this is more than just a blip. That's why I think it's – I think it's definitely here to stay for those performance cars. Um you know, it still remains to be seen if it's going to make it into everybody's car in the next couple of years. But performance-wise, I mean, it has nothing but benefits, I think. You get instant torque right away, mm-hmm. and then you still have that V10 or V12, whatever you have back there in those supercars. And then if you have, like, the the i8, which I got to spend a lot of time in, and I loved having that <clears throat> that immediate torque mm-hmm. every, all the time. It's, it's, it's great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for those comments. I think we're basically kind of generally in an agreement that the electrification of the car in one way or the other is here to stay. Rat and rave time. Anything that's uh, gnawing at your uh, spine that you really want to get off um, your chest or spine? Or look at him go. I guess a quick one. Or I don't know. Just, maybe. A, quick, yeah. just a quick rat and rave. Uh, turn signals everybody could Please Chime use them. On this one. Yeah. Well, I think even beyond that, I think using them properly is something that should be stressed. Um, what is a proper use of a turn well, signal? Well, the, the, the idea— What's an improper use that you're specifically referring to? The idea with? of a turn signal, and I guess maybe this could just be me. I don't know if I had ever read it anywhere, but is to alert somebody before you make any kind of action. Still, instead of when you're halfway so, through the right, turn. Exactly. <laughs> if you're changing a lane, you'll see a blinker yep. come on like maybe halfway through or when All you're right. already in the lane. So thank you for that. Yeah, or the, if you're turning, you're going to turn onto a different street. People start breaking, breaking, breaking. I don't know what this person's going right, to do. Yeah, and, and then, then they put it like on, on right. right. I saw an accident this morning, and I guarantee that's exactly what it was. It was right at a light, and I guarantee the person was making the turn and didn't indicate until they were literally already stopped and about to make the turn. And Person behind him rear-ended him. All right, I think it's something where once you start breaking, you should put it on. Like if it's something, I think it's before, before you start yeah. breaking. Come on, what, Joe. What did, what did well, we learn? Teams. What did we learn in school uh, in driving school? Anyway, did two to three hundred feet, something like that. Yeah, they but I, I mean, yeah, I think I, in terms of breaking, it, it's got to go. The sequence has to be blinker, brake, turn. Right. All right. So we have a very long straightaway going up to the driveway of MPT. Mm-hmm. How? Long, how long of a distance before you get to the driveway do you? I have to say, I'm probably on. about 500 feet, but I'm probably a little more. I, 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 long end, I always yeah. wait because there's a there's a like a call to sack before our driveway. I wait until like as soon as I hit that call to sack, I that's put my too blink. late. You, but yeah, I don't want people to think I'm going to turn in. Yeah, 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 but that can be very confusing because I've seen people get jammed up there. Me too. For that very reason, people because everyone wait. They don't wait to see the vehicle actually turn. See a turn signal go on. Oh, that means I can come out. Mm-hmm. And no, you can't. To me, the secret there is is you don't pull over into the uh, turning lane. There right, is a yeah, turning yeah. lane. You basically put your turn signal on, but you don't get into the turning lane until you get to that little cul-de-sac. Because otherwise, somebody coming out of that cul-de-sac will turn in front of you. Yeah. Which is well, I always use hand signals as well, Greg. Should I do those, should I do those before <laughs> I or after? I should have You don't trust any yeah, kind of electronic signal. Do I do that yeah. before or after the <laughs> electronic signal? Oh, yeah. Okay, you're right. So it's hands. Well, no. Hand it's, signal. it's electronic, then hand, All then right. break. As long as you use your hand and not your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. That brings to a close. I'm... Use your turn signals, folks, in yeah, advance. Please, Tell the other driver what you're going to do. I feel like we were very calm there, too. I yeah, could have gotten well, out of hand. You know, I think it was getting a little – everybody's face was getting a little red. Motor <laughs> Week Podcast 137 comes to a close on that note. We want to thank you very much for uh, listening. And those of you watching our podcast, thank you also for sitting through it. And we want to thank our podcast audio engineer and just general all-around good guy who sets everything up, Jim Bigwood. Jim Bigwood, the, uh, the human, <laughs> the human sandbag. Yep. That's what he – 
That's what he called himself. Yeah, that's not nice. He said, he, he said it himself. <laughs> well, we love you, Jim. We, we love you, love Jim. <laughs> our podcast creator, uh, Bob Mixter, who's not here to defend himself at all, and our podcast uh, producer, Patrick Lucas, the guy with the bell. Okay, join us next time. Be sure to catch Motor Week on public television stations everywhere. Our YouTube channel is alive and well and uh, inviting you to come to take a look at anything you might have missed. Of course, our Velocity uh, folks uh, on um, Velocity has all of our uh, latest shows. Gee, just about anywhere you want to be, Motor Week is there. Thanks very much, and make sure you catch us and keep up with our website at motorweek.org. I'm John Davis, and we'll talk to you soon. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.